Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, my friends. Remember a couple weeks back when we were talking about how Aquaman might swim through the sea at hypersonic velocities at over two times the speed of sound in water? Well, we concluded that he might be using some kind of super cavitation, that he may be enveloping himself in a layer of bubbles that reduces the friction on him such that he can swim through the water much faster while using less power. Well, guess what? Nature kind of already thought up this approach Maybe. As pointed out to me by Samuel Martin 6574 on Instagram, there is a new paper out, well, new to me, there's a paper out that uh, proposes a very interesting hypothesis. So, let's consider the Emperor Penguin. When Emperor Penguins, if you're Benedict Cumberbatch, you can't say the word correctly. When emperor penguins want to jump back onto the ice from the water, they increase their velocity quite a bit. They go from around two meters per second to around five meters per second, which is a lot, you know, it's not that fast for car standards, but it's pretty fast for an animal. It's 11 miles per hour. Now, how do they do this? Well, the paper observed these emperor penguins and they found that every single time they launch themselves up out of the water, like they're jumping out of the water and back onto the ice, there was this trail of bubbles that followed him. Then, in all, of the, in all of their observations, there weren't any penguins that didn't have this bubble trail. So the paper concludes that because nothing else can really explain this uh, increase in velocity from two to about five meters per second, uh, uh, increased power would be too much considering the drag, the buoyant force of the penguin itself doesn't explain it. What it does explain it though is that these penguins seem to capture air at the surface in between their feathers, which are hydro hydrophobic, and then once they are near the surface at increasing velocity, these air bubbles come out and envelop the animal in a layer of air, just like we said that Aquaman might be enveloped in a layer of air. This could act to reduce drag friction, uh, reduce drag and friction so much that they can increase their velocity to the required speeds to jump out of the water and onto the ice without a substantial power increase from their little flappy flaps. So, Aquaman might be doing something like this if he was swimming through the water at high speed, but the awesome thing is that for even these outlandish sci-fi sounding uh, ideas and concepts, a lot of the times nature kind of already has a bead on it, or a bubble, if you will. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live version of Because Science on this channel. Uh, we stream mainly from the YouTube channel, but you may be watching on Twitch or what have you. Welcome. I will take your questions for the next 30 minutes or so. Who am I? Look, I'm not a science expert. I'm not a working scientist, but I know a little bit about a lot of science and pop culture -y stuff, and consider me your guide through nerdery and pop culture and sciencey stuff that you may be wondering about. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat, and hopefully I will get to it. If you are spamming questions, <laughs> I will never get to it. So Nate? Yeah, Mayor, what's up, Kyle? I don't know, I got hair in my eye. Oh no, How you, uh, it's a lot of hair. It's a lot of hair, so uh, I gotta ask. Any questions? Hey, remember that when that was like the last thing that was funny in America? Good times. Good times. From uh, 360 Glaze It. <laughs> yep. That is the coolest name for a donut sh donut shop I've ever heard. It should be 420 Glaze It, obviously. Yeah. But what is the most plausible Pokemon? Which Pokemon do you think could help progress science? <laughs> the most plausible Pokemon is obviously the sentient rock that blows itself up and self-destruct in Geodude. No, of course not. Um, the most plausible Pokemon um, is probably one that adheres most closely to nature or, or design that we've seen before. So the Voltorbs of the world, the Magnetons of the world aren't very plausible, obviously, because they're sentient, inanimate objects, and we don't really have any of those. Um, the Pikachus, uh, the things that already look like animals that we know of, would obviously be a little bit more plausible than the animals, the body plans, the functions, the um, morphology that we've never ever seen before. So something like a Pikachu, something like a Growlithe, um, but of course it's not going to be spouting fire. Okay, so what's, what's the most plausible Pokemon that has all the Pokemon's moves in it? Um, uh, Kakuna? Matata? 
Kakuna Matata? Uh, Kakuna maybe because uh, it's forming a chrysalis that gets harder as time goes on so it can um, change morphologically inside uh, of the chrysalis. So it, it could use harden in real life. Caterpillars use harden in real life. So let's go with a Weedle, Kakuna, that kind of type. Um, do you know what happens inside a chrysalis? Uh, a caterpillar's entire body just uh, dissolves and it reforms into a butterfly. It's really, really cool. How does nature know how to do that? Evolution! It's amazing. Uh, what's the most what Pokemon would be most useful to science, though? That is a harder question. Um, what, what, what field of science would we want to try to probe with some kind of Pokemon power? Um, I think that would probably be, that would probably be it's live probably be some kind of psychic type type Pokemon that would uh, reveal some kind of fundamental force of nature that we are not quite aware of. The reason why a superpower or you know some kind of paranormal thing like telepathy, like mind reading, like telekinesis, th why those are very, very implausible, probably impossible, is because we as humans and scientists and researchers, engineers, etc., we've explored most of the energy regimes in the universe, from very, very low energy stuff, uh, to, you know, just pushing an apple across a desk, <laughs> to very, very high energy stuff, um, uh, like uh, particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider. There isn't a whole lot of room for forces that we have never, ever experienced or seen or observed or measured before. There's not a whole lot of room for those forces that would act on our scale, which is to say that uh, it makes it very unlikely that telekinesis is actually a thing because we've never seen some invisible, non-interactive force operating at our macroscopic level. With how long we've been around and have been observing the world, it's very unlikely that we missed a force that would be so consequential. We'd observe it somehow or get some kind of inkling of some kind of particle interaction um, at one of these scales. So that makes that very uh, unlikely. So a Pokemon like Mew, like Mewtwo, like... Kadabra or Alakazam uh, would be very, very interesting to science because it would push us into a different kind of energy or, or fundamental force of nature regime where we haven't explored before. It'd be like opening up dark matter or dark energy. It would be uh, something that was previously inaccessible to us, and that would be very, very interesting, I imagine. Unless, you know, they just teleport away and you keep trying to catch them and then you grab Seismic Toss so you can level up Abra because it only has teleport, and then once you level it up to 16, you get Kadabra, you get Psybeam, and then you start just annihilating people uh, on your way to the final four. I played a lot of Pokemon Red, but I lost it on the plane. What's next? From Allison Ross, if we could harvest ice from water from planetary rings and asteroids like they do... I thought you said eyes. Ice. Ice. Like they do in the expanse. Woo! Would it be safe to drink? Would space water be safe to drink? Huh. I have no idea. I, I, it would be um, very dependent on the specific composition of, um, of that space ice. And so how do we treat water um, just on Earth? We run it through different kinds of filtration systems like reverse osmosis or just very, very fine meshes. We treat it with chlorine to deal uh, with microorganisms and things that make us sick. And we remove pollutants by putting other chemicals in it and then sifting it all out uh, with what's called flocculation, these kind of things, uh, wastewater treatment. So we are mostly removing pollutants and uh, microorganisms from our, from our water supply and making sure the water is uh, potable and uh, you know drinkable safe and uh, it's palatable that is to say it tastes right um, if water doesn't have the right uh, amount of minerals and um, you know it's not, it's not exactly contaminants but if, if the water doesn't have the right uh, concentration of other things besides water it doesn't taste quite right uh, the right uh, dissolved ions in it and salts and, and minerals, etc. So uh, what space water would taste like, what it, if it would be safe, it would have to have some kind of uh, concentration similar to what we drink here on Earth. Um, but I imagine that it wouldn't have the same kind of hazard. Uh, I mean, I'm just guessing here. I imagine it wouldn't have the same kind of hazard that drinking from, let's say, a pool of standing water on the sidewalk would. You know, this could have microorganisms in it, it could have pollutants in it, and if you were in the rings uh, of some kind of, you know, gas giant or something like that, then I'm going to guess there's no microorganisms in it, there's probably no life in it, and there's probably no pollutants as we know them in it because it's not been exposed to, you know, 
a uh, hundred years worth of air pollution, et cetera. So I, I would I would bet that space ice is not undrinkable, or or at least it doesn't seem on its face like it would be immediately dangerous, unless. I mean, there could be something else that I'm not thinking of, like uh, radiation, cosmic radiation from space is transmuting stuff in a, in a dangerous elements. But if it doesn't have the same contaminants and it has a mineral uh, composition similar to uh, our tap water, then it might be just fine. But we would definitely, if we ever harvested ice from space, we would definitely run it through all our common methods of filtration anyway. So it's kind of moot in that way. And to find liquid water in space would be a whole whole different thing because then you'd be on a planet, you know, right temperature and stuff. What's next? From Patrick Porter. I love Expanse questions. I was wondering what you think about Green Lantern and the other Lantern core rings. Do you think we can ever have the technology powered by emotion? Ooh. Technology powered by emotion. Uh, so um, let me kind of reroute your question a little bit. Uh, you know, Green Lantern, Green Lantern Core, they deal with power rings that uh, respond to your emotions and project stuff out of light. And so this kind of gets at the so-called hard light um, uh, concept in science fiction where something like a, a halo plasma sword has hard light. It is photons that act as though they're a solid and can cut into stuff. Um, and this is probably what a Green Lantern ring would have. It's projecting, it looks like it, it looks like. It's projecting light into a solid object like a giant cartoonish Donkey Kong-ish hammer that you can hit stuff with. Um, uh, as, as far as I know, and I don't know very much, uh, hard light, at least in the way you see it in power rings, is either impossible or completely beyond our ability to uh, replicate or uh, generate right now. It would take you know, a, a grand leap in technology. But uh, to reroute your question just a little bit, again, there is something that kind of comes close to this, which I want to mention. Um, uh, a paper came out uh, mentioning things called voxels. And voxels were like uh, three-dimensional pixels in space. So imagine this. Imagine you had, uh, you had uh, between, in, in some volume, you had, in some volume, you had lasers expertly focusing uh, their energy into this space, all at the same point. And if you did that, you would create little bits of plasma at these specific areas. Now, in three-dimensional space, you have pixels, or voxels as the paper call them, pixels of plasma. These are th plasma is something that you can touch and you can feel on your finger. So what the researchers did is they made shapes out in three-dimensional shapes by firing lasers from all directions and making little pockets of plasma such that they looked three-dimensional and you could touch them. It's kind of like if you've ever seen those uh, paperweights where they have bubbles inside of glass. Uh, it, it, it's the same thing, creating plasma bubbles in three-dimensional space, and you can actually touch them and you can actually feel them. That is much closer, to me at least, to the conception of like a hard light kind of thing, where you can use lasers and light to create something in three-dimensional space that you could touch. Um, I, I, I mean, if, if you extrapolated this technology all the way out and made a giant hammer out of, you know, three-dimensional plasma hammer in space from a ring, I wouldn't want to get hit by it. Who knows? It might just fail, like the movie. What's next? From Franco G. Woo! Taking shots! Can you explain what are gravitational waves? Uh, yeah, 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 gravitational waves, oh, I forget how they're transmitted, but I mean, very generally speaking, gravitational waves, which the detection of which won Nobel Prize for uh, some other guy, I always forget his name, poor dude, and Kip Thorne, uh, the guy who wrote uh, interstellar or was a science advisor on interstellar kip thorne they won an, uh, a nobel prize for the detection of gravitational waves what are gravitational waves well very generally speaking because i'm not an expert um, gravitational waves are ripples in space-time uh, a gravitational disturbance so massive that that disturbance travels out at the speed of light the speed of information the speed of light out and you can feel that disturbance somewhere else um, so uh, I, I think one of the observations came, uh, they imagined, from two black holes 
billions of years ago that were orbiting each other and then ate each other. And when they ate each other, they came together, increased masses. And when this happened, this created a ripple in space time out in all directions like this ish, you know, it, some were closer together, some were further apart, what have you. So the, this ripple in space time was like throwing a rock into a pond. If you imagine the, uh, the disturbance of a rock hitting water and creating a ripple, it's kind of like this, this momentous, uh, gigantic, energetic event rippling the fabric of space and time. Those ripples went out and they, uh, they emitted in all directions, and billions of years later, we tried to detect them. How did we try to detect them? Oh, off the top of my head. Okay, so we had an observation device called uh, LIGO, uh, LIGO, which basically, had, basically was shaped like an L, except these Ls were kilometers long. It's, I think it was the largest amount, or one of the largest amounts of empty space on the planet because you had these two kilometer long tubes evacuated with air and uh, mirrors in them and lasers. So the idea was is that when you fire lasers down the length of LIGO here, you can know very precisely how long it takes the laser to travel this distance and so you very precisely know these distances here. The idea was was that when these gravitational waves finally got to LIGO, that these waves actually changed because space-time itself was rippling. These uh, waves actually changed the distance between the mirrors and of this structure. And if it changed the distance of this structure, then you would be able to measure that change with the laser. You keep firing the laser and suddenly it's not the right value anymore and then it goes back to the right value. That could have been a ripple in space time. And that's basically, I may be getting some parts of this wrong, but that's basically how we observe gravitational waves. A wave of gravitation passed through the Earth and we felt it with an ultra, ultra, ultra precise uh, uh, environment. This, the, the, just the construction of LIGO was an engineering uh, masterpiece in and of itself. I think it took decades, like 50 years, billions of dollars, just to finally put this all together. And then we started uh, detecting gravitational waves left, right, and center. So gravitational waves are ripples in space-time, um, and it, they happen for everything. I mean, everything affects space-time. You and I are creating ripples in space-time. Why we observe things like black holes eating each other is because we need something so large, uh, uh, something so large that it produces a loud, a loud enough signal for us to detect. If I was near LIGO and started, I don't know, just dancing around, my gravitational disturbance wouldn't be, uh, would be so small that this, even this kilometers long, uh, instrument isn't sensitive enough to detect the change. That's why we need gigantic sources of, uh, of waves. And that is also why LIGO is so big, because the change in distances uh, can be so small that if you had a very small detector, that's even smaller of a change over the total length of the thing. So you want the thing to be as long as possible. That is in a gist, kind of, and again, I might be getting some parts wrong, it is in a gist uh, what happened with the detection of gravitational waves and what they are. Uh, there's a lot of great books on it. You can look them up. I hope I got most of that right. But it's, it, I was at, uh, was it uh, 2016? 2015, uh, at the last White House Science Fair. And uh, how cool this is. I'm, I'm kind of name dropping, but, you know, bear with me. Uh, how cool this is and how momentous this is to be able to create a device to detect something so, um, you know, so beyond human perception is so cool that at the White House uh, Science Fair, uh, then President Barack Obama, he was talking about this and he said, yeah, I heard uh, we detected gravitational waves. It's kind of like the whole, uh, whole room got bigger and then smaller. It's pretty cool. I agree, Mr. President. It was pretty cool. And it is. What's next? From Orangitis. Orangitis. Again? I thought you had this dealt with. You have scurvy, sir. Eat something. Speaking of which... Oh, uh, no, that would be inflammation due to oranges. Stop eating oranges. You're gonna die, man. I'm not a doctor. 
Are bacteria susceptible to viruses like we multicellular cellular, cellular can't even say that word organisms are? I know you got there. <laughs> uh, are bacteria susceptible? <laughs> Dang it! Are bacteria susceptible to viruses in the same way that we are? Um. Yes. Yes. Um. And I hope I'm getting this right. Again, this is all off the top of my head. This is all live. So um, if you've ever heard, look at this. Watch what I'm about to do. If you've ever heard of CRISPR, <laughs> if you've ever heard of CRISPR, that's clustered, clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Oh, yeah, there's... <laughs> There's no E here. Clustered, <laughs> clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Um, so CRISPR is a genetic editing tool that we got from bacteria who are trying to fight or continuously fight off incoming viruses. So what CRISPR does in bacteria, it's, uh, it's a section of genetic code uh, that uh, bacteria send out into themselves or out I think it's just into themselves when viruses are present. Anyway, they send out, and these, uh, these, uh, this genetic information goes and finds viruses, and it goes into their DNA, and it clips out specific places of that virus DNA to inactivate the virus, in effect, killing the virus. This is a defense mechanism. Bacteria sending out pieces of its own DNA in order to go out and snip virus DNA and it kills the virus. So yes, bacteria are susceptible to viruses. Uh, just about everything is. Uh, and are viruses alive? Who knows? But CRISPR is one of the things that proves that uh, bacteria are susceptible to viruses. And uh, <laughs> this battle has been going on for so long that this has become so refined that now we have found that we can use this to edit the DNA of anything on the planet. It's incredibly powerful and a uh, very promising uh, place, uh, very very promising field and a very hot field in science right now. <laughs> oh, whoa, 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 what's next? From Samira Pete. Well, that could have gone on for a minute. How do scientists analyze stuff super far away like black holes and other galaxies? Uh, scientists observe things that are super, super, super far away by using uh, very good instrumentation, whether that be um, uh, Many different kinds of observations could uh, come together to give you an impression of what's happening very, very far away. And these, if we're talking astronomy, are usually telescopes. But it's not always visual, uh, not always visible light that they're looking for. It could be uh, X-ray radiation that they're looking for. It could, have a, it could be a radio telescope looking for radio waves transmitting themselves throughout the universe, throughout the void. So usually, when you're looking at something very, very far away and very uh, backwards in time, as it so happens, uh, it's usually looking for electromagnetic radiation from things uh, that we pick up in very large observational devices. And we try to collect as much of that radiation as possible to put the pieces together with computers so that we can uh, get good resolution on things that are even you know, hundreds of thousands of light years away, more or less. What's next? From Ryan Anderson. Hello, Ryan. What would happen to a human body if, by itself, it broke the sound barrier? Would the forces blow them apart? Oh, what would happen if a human body broke the sound barrier? Naked? I don't know. Um, people have gone the speed of sound before. You can do this in fighter jets. Uh, I think, you know, like the F-22 Raptor or something like that goes like Mach 1.5, Mach 2, something. Uh, so very, very fast, but I don't know if anyone has ever been completely exposed to wind, to air, to normal earth air, at the speed of sound. Because usually to go that fast, you need to be in something that is going that fast. What would happen to the human body exactly? I'm not sure. Uh, the immediate effects would be how quickly did you get up to that speed? Are you accelerating up to the speed of sound very quickly? If that's the case, then uh, acceleration forces, G forces, would put a lot of pressure on your body and your blood and your organs, and that could be very damaging. Um, but to your skin, I'm not so sure. I, I'm, I don't think you'd be ripped apart. Um, wind, uh, when it's going really, really fast, it, you know, it, it would probably be painful, um, but there's not a whole lot of mass there. So I, it's, it's very hard to say. Um, hmm. I mean, you can find comparisons like, uh, you know, like uh, sand blowers. What are they called? Not sand blowers. Anything, the, the, the things, 
the things that you put sand in and you blow air with it and it removes stuff from like paint and walls. Is that what it's called, Nate? You don't know. Uh, so uh, so you, you could f find some kind of analog and I've seen uh, sandblasters sandblasting injuries and that has air going very, very quickly. I don't know if it's Mach 1, um, but it can kind of... It, kind of causes like a road rash kind of thing, but that's because there's particulate in it. Although there would probably, probably be particulate in wind if you were going that fast, you know, over the dirt or something like that. So very hard to say. I cannot say conclusively, but I do not think it would immediately rip you limb from limb. That's what I'll say. I'll, I'll stand by that. One, last question. Last question. Last question. From Lisa D. Hello, Lisa. Any tips for someone who wants to get into rock climbing? First tip, climb a lot. If you want to get into rock climbing, if you have the rock climbing bug, I've been rock climbing twice a week for the last 12 years on average. I've calculated it. <laughs> if you want to get into rock climbing, start doing it quite a bit. You're not going to see very many improvements unless you are doing it more than twice a week. If you're doing it two times a week, you're going to get pretty good. If you're doing it three or four times a week, you're going to get very good very fast. Once you hit, if you're talking about bouldering, if you're starting at V0, it goes from a V0 to V16 scale. V0 being the absolute easiest that anyone can do. V16 being the hardest that only maybe two people can do. Then you're going to get to about V4 in the first couple of months. Let's say three to four months. At that stage, then you want to start actually doing weight training. And that kind of weight training can, can be anything from having a weight vest to just climbing uh, even more to doing what we call mileage. Or you can start doing a lot of pull-ups, start lifting weights and then you're going to start to hit a barrier once you get to around V7, V8. And once you get to that, you're going to want to start training very methodically. You are training on specific holds, specific problems, and then you are weight training, you are changing your diet, and then uh, even further than that, you start getting into double-digit V levels, and that's more of a professional, amateur professional range, and that's how you can get a lot better very quickly. I'd recommend first climbing very uh, often and then changing your diet and then just doing uh, a bunch of climbing-specific workouts. If you want to get better at climbing, you don't just want to lift weights. You want to simulate rock climbing in your workouts. That's a lot of pull-ups. That's a lot of finger work on fingerboards that you can get, and that's what I would recommend to get better at rock climbing very soon. Have you can, can you tell I've talked about that before? Thank you so much for watching. Because Science Live, oh, look at all we did. It's pretty good. Thank you for joining me this week. Uh, there was a new episode of The Science of Mortal Kombat all about blood projectiles. If you haven't seen it yet, go check that out. I'm very proud of how the series turned out. It looks great. And I love me some Alan Pan. Also, next week, we have a uh, behind-the-scenes episode for that episode that I just mentioned. We have a new vlog, new live stream, new episode of Because Science, which I think you're going to like a lot, especially if you're a big old book nerd. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Be nice to each other, because this is all we got.